All right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of today's event. Uh, you heard uh, Lee's voice there and see his video. Uh, Lee Badman is back with us today, CWNE number 200. He is a wireless architect at a very well-respected uh, university in the Northeast. Uh, Heather Dremel is back with us, our digital marketing manager, and of course, Mr. Bada, CWNE 183, and our chief wireless officer. Um, and with that, uh, Jim's going to give a little intro, and during that time, I'm going to hand the controls over to you, Lee, and we'll go ahead and get started. Sounds good. Well, we're really glad to have Lee Badman with us again this week. Uh, Lee is a prolific blogger. He's entertaining. He can take, uh, you know, pretty dry subjects like physical security and make them interesting. And uh, we're always excited to have him on. So thanks for being here, Lee. Thank you, Jim. And I have to say you are my favorite person in the whole world with a silent J in your name. Excellent. Got that going for you. You're going to be a <laughs> trivia question one day, Jim. Oh, yeah. There you go. How do you spell my name? Yeah. yeah so uh, got to say congrats to Seven Signal on a good year. Um, everything you guys have done and everything you got coming, that, that's huge. So good for you on all of that. And um, you know, echoing Don Sonneman's happy holidays to everybody in attendance in advance, in case I forget to say so at the end of this. And today we are talking about uh, physical security and the wireless network. Sometimes they don't immediately get put together in people's minds, um, but we will talk about why they need to be. So let's get on with it. Uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you for the intro again, Jim. As Chuck Norris said, physical security matters when it comes to the wireless LAN. Um, this is one of those topics that you can uh, fairly easily overlook, um, especially when uh, you're hurrying on your installations, or maybe you don't have uh, a lot of depth in planning of projects, or if you've never been uh, bitten by an actual uh, physical security incident, or if something happened and in your mind you didn't pause and say, you know, that kind of falls under the heading of physical security and, and we should learn a lesson here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of flush all of this out as we go, but it's just an important topic and like i said it it doesn't always just link itself up to wireless networking in people's thoughts but hopefully we can change that today and before we dig in you know let's get the juices flowing with a few questions um you know so if i ask you what's unique about wireless uh networking when it comes to physical security Hopefully, you're thinking, you know, we have more exposed uh, infrastructure devices with wireless networking um, than if we didn't have wireless networking, got APs all over the place, uh, jacks in weird places feeding those APs, um, mobile devices, client devices, growing number of those in type and um, quantity, you know, kind of easy to steal. And if we also kind of think about what wireless is, we're dealing with a medium that is unbounded, right? Wireless goes everywhere, um, at least to the edge of its cell. And then if you have a high gain antenna out on the other side, you know, your understanding of your cell edge might be, might be different from mine when I'm out there with a high gain antenna trying to do crazy stuff. So um, wireless is definitely different from uh, traditional uh, wired networking and let's say in my mind as familiar as we all are with wireless every now and then it's worth pausing um, for the basics and, and thinking about that regrounding ourselves if you will it's so my second question there you know are all wireless lands created similarly obviously they are not um, we all uh, hopefully approach uh, the way we do wireless networking with the requirements of that network in mind and requirements can vary and also the physical security that comes the physical security needs that come with different wireless network scenarios are going to vary as well 
uh, what makes one environment more vulnerable to physical security threats versus another. And again, these are, you know, you could have a lot of discussion about any of these. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, some of the obvious answers, you know, what is going on on that network? What is the, you know, the operational value of what's going on on that network? A hotel guest network is obviously going to have different physical security uh, needs, different network needs and network security needs in general than, you know, a Wall Street trading floor or a, um, you know, production facility that relies on Wi-Fi for, um, you know, putting out lots and lots and lots of product and stuff like that. So, you know, environments vary and therefore, um, you know, their concerns as far as any kind of security, including physical security, are going to vary. Kind of a rhetorical question, do your, pol do your operational policies cover physical security uh, of the WAN, of the wireless LAN, and should they? Well, absolutely. Hopefully, this isn't something that gets left out. Even though it can be kind of nebulous and kind of hard to quantify, like I say, hopefully we'll, um, you know, um, temper that a little bit and make it a little bit easier for you to have some context. Um, and yeah, it's not a topic that should be left out of your overall security posture. And just to drive that point home, you know, physical security as it applies to the wireless network should be part of any organization's overall security approach. Um, it, kind of hopefully is obvious just like wi-fi is only part of the overall network uh, environment you know physical security of either the wireless or the wired network should just be part of the overall approach so we're kind of looking at a subset of something that hopefully you're um, thinking about and applying with every uh, wireless project that gets put out there hopefully at least the box is being checked and you know some thought being given to it so certainly not a comprehensive list um you know we've only got a short period of time today so we're going to talk about high level um you know physical security concerns when it comes to wireless and it's really meant to be more uh, thought provoking than it is um, we've covered all the bases in a half hour. It just doesn't work like that. But it, again, at the same time, hopefully you walk away with at least a feeling of, yeah, you know, there was some stuff there that I, I don't tend to think about. So under that heading, um, you know, high level concerns, general concerns about wireless network security. Uh, what happens if an AP goes missing? Um, you know, Environmental damage may not be a security topic per se, but they have great parallels. Um, you know, the environmental concerns and physical security, that's why I've included it. When that uh, very important uplink port is exposed, you know, what might be leveraged or exploited there? When we have signal where it shouldn't be, there's going to be some stuff to think about. And, uh, you know, ever more um, possible with the way we're using wireless, you know, client devices out there. What happens when one of the, when one of those is stolen? What are possible ramifications of that scenario? And those are the uh, discussion points we're gonna use today to advance the topic of physical security. We're gonna start with what happens when an access point goes missing? What's the risk? Um, there's no way to um, not lead with it depends because it really does. Um, you know, for some small businesses, a single access point may be the network. So in that case, if if the AP goes missing, your entire you know big part of your operation might have just walked away. But in an enterprise, um, you know, depends. Um, perhaps if your design isn't uh, dense, you know, the AP walks away and now you've got a coverage gap for some critical service. 
I'm not a fan of using wireless uh, CCTV cameras, um, not at all for a number of reasons, but there are people who do. Well, what happens if your AP goes away, the service is a camera, you're not dense, maybe it's part of a coordinated thing. Somebody did their homework and realizes that, hey, that camera is nothing without that AP, let's make that AP go away. And you know, now we've got a kind of a, a more sophisticated physical uh, breach happening, perhaps. Um, you know, what flavor of AP is in use? And when I say flavor, I'm talking about, you know, is this uh, CAPWAP in APs or is this something that perhaps is more autonomous? And there's still a fair amount of those out there. A lot of the cloud APs approximate a fat AP. Um, they have some intelligence so that the, when the cloud goes away, they keep working. And from what I can tell um, from the ones I've played with, some of them are, are pretty uh, bulletproof or pretty hardened. So if I steal the AP, I can't get a lot of config information out of it, but then depending on the age, <clears throat> excuse me, and depending on uh, whose hardware you're using, you might actually be able to get some um, you know, network configuration out of, information out of the AP that might tell you a little bit more about the way the the network works or might have some credential on there that you can take out and use to uh, warm your way into the network in, in deeper ways. Um, if it's a fat AP, that tends to be more of a concern, um, especially if it hasn't been locally protected or everything has been left in default, God forbid, um, but things happen. Uh, one thing that's interesting is even if the AP can't connect, what is it trying to do on boot up? You know, if it's got a little bit of a config stored on it and it still needs to talk to a mothership, is it trying to reach out to something on boot up that a bad guy can intercept using a console cable because he stole the AP and start to gain some information about your network? Um, again, there, there's a whole bunch of, you know, other uh, little things to talk about when an, a when an AP gets stolen or whatever. Um, but again, this is just meant to, um, you know, get the juices flowing about, eh, you know, <laughs> we don't tend to think about that. We just throw another one up and move on. But depending on what those APs are and how they've been configured, it really can matter. And then as always, there's the cost of replacement. APs in general are not getting cheaper. Um, you'd think by now, you know, they've been commoditized and Wi-Fi is everywhere. The vendors keep on finding ways to, you know, keep that price well north of a thousand bucks in some cases, um, sometimes even after discounts. So um, depending on your budget, that can be real money to some organizations. So let's talk about something else. Well, let's talk about, yes, the AP was stolen or removed and now there's a network port sitting there and that network port is live. What does that give the bad guy? As I mentioned in the beginning, what makes uh, wireless networks different when it comes to physical security, one of the things that makes them different is we just got ports everywhere because we have APs everywhere. Um, not all of those APs are way up high, like in warehouses. Some of them are, you know, barely above your head. And I could certainly, if you haven't secured the AP, I could certainly take it down off the wall, plug in my laptop and, and see what I can get off of that port in some cases. And there's so many APs and so many, um, you know, uh, hallways and back rooms and stuff that maybe nobody ever sees me doing that. And that's just a fact of life. So, you know, is that port a access port? And if it's an access port, is it just a management VLAN that really has no um, access to anything beyond itself? And all it can do is get to a controller and I didn't put DHCP on it, or if I did put DHCP, it's you know a registered, you know static registers or registrations for DHCP, and I plug in that laptop and I can't get an IP address and I can't do anything, or somehow I'm quarantined or whatever. All of this is going to matter on what the bad guy or the potential bad guy can do, and what they can get to, and what they can see, and what they can learn. Um, if it's a trunk port. You know, I have APs that 
you know, the non-CAP WAP APs, um, you know, I, I might have five to eight uh, VLANs going into a given AP. And depending on what tool you're using, each one of those can lead all kinds of places for somebody sniffing the network. Um, if I go back to the access VLAN, if my network is flat, everything is on one particular VLAN and it is an access port, that could be everything. That could give so, and this is kind of the SMB um, situation or um, you know, medium-sized network that just wasn't laid out with any sophistication. That can get to my router that maybe got left in default, and that can get to my network storage, and that can get to my cameras. And um, you know, there, there really is a lot at risk here to at least be aware of. Um, certainly, 802.1x, um, you know, device authentication on LAN ports um, can help, but it can also be really hard to implement depending on your environment and your uh, staff talent. Um, it is powerful, you know, one defense against all of this, it is powerful to alert on uh, LAN devices that, you know, shouldn't be there on certain VLANs, you know, back to that concept of maybe it's a management VLAN for the APs. Something comes up that I didn't put there, you know, is there a mechanism in place to, to get an alert? That is a technical possibility if you want to go so far to implement something like that. And the bottom bullet there kind of summarizes it. You know, I might have, you know, kind of bounced around a little bit, but the sophistication of the network and what your policy is and your configurations and your tolerance and humor when it comes to uh, security um, for all the bullets above, that's gonna kind of go back and answer the question of, it depends, but it depends on what. I remember way back when, um, way back when, this would go back to easily the days of 802.11b, uh, we had the, got a call from a, a computer guy in one of our colleges and he's like, you gotta come over and see this. So I did, it was the building next door. The room probably had 40 foot ceilings and somehow students piled up enough stuff to climb up on top of it and plug a laptop into the port where the AP should have been. Um, so it's not always the low hanging fruit. You know, sometimes people go to extreme silly lengths for whatever reason um, to get at these ports. As I mentioned, environmental damage, um, not really a security uh, issue, not really a security concern, but close enough in impact and parallel concerns where to me it's it's a good place to uh, loop it into the discussion um you know if you're putting ap's in places where they're going to be tampered with you're kind of asking for trouble hotels are always surprise me you know when a hotel is it or when an ap is at eye height or an ap is just sitting there on the desk in your room it does make me at least think you know what happens if if I get at that port? And I can't say I'm ever ambitious enough to go that far, but the security side of my brain at least gives it a little bit of a, at least a little bit of thought. And I'm sure that there are people who do the disconnect and you know answer those questions that I don't bother to get ambitious enough to go probing for from you know for myself. But um, or maybe you use the wrong AP for the situation. And you know, a good example of that is, have you ever seen somebody put up a indoor AP outside? Well, I just, I hung it under an eave. It's gonna be protected, you know, should be fine. Um, just asking for trouble. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter what we do, our best efforts to keep, you know, APs or other network hardware safe and, you know, Probably in the last year or two, in my environment, we've had at least three or four that are waterlogged. You know, starts off an AP went down, technician goes out and finds that for some reason water came from above and filled up the AP. Really, it was not bad planning or anything. It was just a pipe broke, and usually our AP is just part of what gets hit. And 
There are enclosures you can get and certainly should get for the right environment, not only to protect against physical theft, but there's also environmental concerns um, that enclosures can help with. A lot of times people don't even think about the um, you know, heat and the sun. People tend to think about the cold, but they don't think about APs um, exceeding their operational um, temperature limits and they can get hot and shut down. <coughs> Um, when we're talking about outdoor APs, um, you know, depending on where you are, point to point bridging is another example of this. Uh, certainly you're gonna wanna give the electrical concerns with the static crashes, lightning, all of that. You're gonna wanna give some thought to protecting your APs. And kind of comes back to, you know, I'm using that word parallel, you know, parallel concerns with physical security. Yeah, it sucks to have to replace stuff, especially components that are not cheap because they could have been uh, implemented better to begin with. And when coverage is lost, when you lose the component, sometimes it's real easy to put a dollar, uh, you know, a dollar value on that lack of coverage. We were out for six hours and in that six hours, uh, this is what we lost. So, um, you know, again, more food for thought. So a lot of people um, don't tend to think about this when it comes to physical security. And I say that from you know past audits and conversations I've had and going way back to the early days of wireless security um, when things were a lot less robust uh, for encryption and all of that. But what are some of the concerns when we end up with our Wi-Fi signal where it shouldn't be? You know, we set out to cover specific areas and um, sometimes it doesn't matter if we bleed out into the parking lot and sometimes it does. And, um, you know, can't say it enough, each scenario and situation is gonna be different, but um, so you've got too much power. You've got, you know, an antenna that's just way too directional for the situation or worse you're putting an ssid somewhere where it shouldn't be you know perhaps you've got a secure part of the building where you absolutely should not have your guest ssid or vice versa you know you've got a lobby or conference rooms that you know a lot of guests show up in and maybe you've got some super secret ssid used for execs that just shouldn't be there um you know RF is uh, RF is RF, and if you don't take care of it, you know it can bite you as much as it can benefit you. Uh, a lot of times, people just assume, yeah, you know, it's a thick wall. You know, we're not going to be putting anything on the other side of that because it's a thick wall. Uh, sometimes the modeling tools get it wrong. So, you know, basically, if you have places where signal should not be, and you've identified in your physical security policy and your wireless uh, approach, whether it's just an SSID or whether it's you know the the wireless network itself, all SSIDs, any SSIDs, you're gonna want to do some checking and make sure that you know fairly routinely audit that not only can I not pick it up with my iPhone, but if I you know go to the parking lot next door and I've got even a moderately uh, decent antenna, am I gonna be able to pick this thing up? So and again, that's where security really counts and where you really, really, really are worried about the uh, the particular wireless network or SSID. Um, hopefully APs aren't getting added without approval. You know, a lot of times there are places where an AP should not be um, for various reasons and this, may be security, this may be uh, research like on a university campus or you know certain industrial places. You know, I cannot have any signal in this zone, so please don't put an AP there. Uh, hopefully, you know, everybody is aware of those constraints and nobody's doing anything goofy like that and adding them um, without it being coordinated with whoever manages the network. But regardless, when it comes to the, the overall topic of you know, signal where it should not be, um, the configuration of the wireless network is gonna determine the overall vulnerability. You know, do I have an open network? Do I have just an easily guessed PSK? Do I got robust 
uh, TLS 802.1X. You know, what is what is going on um, with the wireless network and its configuration um, when it hits the areas where it shouldn't be? <clears throat> and client device theft. That would be wireless um, client device theft. If you jump down to the towards the bottom of the slide there, I'll give you a few examples of what I'm seeing uh, more and more of digital signs, people counters, um, time clocks. These are devices that go on the wall, they connect to the wireless network. And a lot of times, if one of those were to walk away, I'm not going to know it as the wireless network administrator, and I know that nobody is really keeping a good inventory of them. Um, but at the same time, that particular time clock, I know that if I take one of those off the wall, the way that they're set up, I'm gonna be able to learn an awful lot about the network from it if I just start picking around its configuration. Um, same thing with digital signage. A lot of the digital signage are just USB stick computers. And you're at the mercy of whoever administered that USB stick computer and you know it might have a shared credential in there. And if they're using you know, even if you're using 802.1x and I can get to that shared credential and that shared credential is um, on, you know, a thousand of these devices spread out around an environment because they were uh, not ambitious enough to recognize that maybe we shouldn't use a shared credential on a thousand devices. Um, that can be a gold mine for, a, you know, somebody who's bent on doing bad stuff. Um, a lot of the devices, you know, thankfully a lot of our mobile compute devices can be locked down good, you know, using MDM, but at the same time as more IoT stuff um, gets put on the network with varying levels of uh, talent and sophistication by those who administer them, when one of those devices walks away, you gotta give some thought to, okay, uh, it was reported that that was stolen what's the impact of that? What's the potential impact of that? Do we need to take some countermeasures because one of these things just walked away and we're just learning that they used a shared credential um, or such? Uh, I can't tell you how many of these sorts of situations. Thankfully, there's not a tremendous amount of uh, theft. And a lot of times when they go missing, um, they can be found if they're still in the environment because you track them down by MAC address. But at the same time, just the implications for uh, this sort of stuff and the trouble that they can cause if they do go missing, um, you know, it, it's kind of profound to think about. Not to mention the exact laptop. You know, I left my laptop in the cab and the cab drove off and I'm never going to see it again. You know, well, that laptop turns on those instant VPN or you know device tunnel, Active Directory device tunnel, or something right back to the corporate network. Um, the the whole notion of client device theft or loss is uh, is quite the topic to think about. I'm just watching the clock here, and I want to make sure there's time for Q and A. So I would offer to you, you know, just just consider. Um, give physical security some thought because so many people don't, especially when it comes to the wireless network. Some of the low hanging fruit, you know, we've all got wall plate APs out there now. Um, are you actually using the optional tamper proof screw that the vendor gives you? You know, are you using legitimate mounts or are you putting that, you know, 50 pound uh, heifer of an AP up with nylon, anchors and you know that thing can pull out of the ceiling and land on somebody now you got bigger problems um, you know locking enclosures and cages and such in some environments it very much is worth I know I'm preaching to the choir in some environments it very it very much is worth hiding the APs out of sight out of mind um, that's the ultimate in tamper proofing if you can do it where it's needed and it's not always needed to that extreme um, but that notion of AP redundancy, if you were to lose an AP, like I said earlier in the talk, if you were to lose an AP and that gives you a signal gap for something that's critical, you didn't design the network right. Be aware of what 
of how your network is being used and provision for it so that you don't get bit by that sort of situation. Um, we talked about the client devices and the fun that they're bringing to the wireless network these days. Um, but the big thing to end with is policy and audit on both the physical and the admin security of the wireless utility devices uh, tends to be an afterthought, but it really shouldn't be. Um, you know, I should be able to ask my clock administrator if these are all wireless, well, how many do you have? How many do you see? When's the last time that one checked in? What if it walked away? You know, do, do we know that? Have we talked that through? Have we, have we thought about that? And, uh, a lot of times the answer is no, 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 but it's important. And hopefully we've got some time for um, Q&A and your thoughts, Jim. Yeah, thanks Lee. Great presentation as always. Uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, people, you know, poking around. One of the things I do uh, when I travel, especially in hotels and Airbnbs, is I just bring my own little travel AP, and uh, you know I'll scan the room looking for Ethernet ports. Uh, hotel Wi-Fi is iffy, and so you know I'll try to put up my own AP on a channel they're not using, and and just go about my business. And it's amazing how often I can do that just without any issue. Sometimes. There are, uh, you know, switch ports behind TVs or behind microwaves, and sometimes there are um, uh, Ethernet ports on those wall plate APs. They often have two or three extra Ethernet ports, um, and ceiling mounted APs do as well. So you need to consider those as a possible access uh, to your wired network as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And maybe it's intended that they be used. And that's one thing. And it's another thing if, you know, they got put in and we could say that notion of a flat network, if I can plug into one of those ports and all of a sudden I run, uh, what is it, Fang or Fang or whatever that is, and I can see the front desk point of sale terminals from one of those ports, uh, we might have problems. Absolutely. So good, some good questions uh, from the audience. Um, first, uh, coming in from Robert, he says, uh, can you define a fat AP? And, uh, you know, I think, Lee, that's kind of been a moving target since we've had uh, so many cloud-based uh, systems come out now. What? How do you define a fat AP? Uh, the absolute safe definition is a AP that can run all by itself without a controller you can do all of its um, configuration and it, it can just work unto itself um, you know where it gets so, so you know go back to the days of uh, you know Cisco 350s and uh, whatever that other early model was they're, they're just autonomous you configure them one at a time um, each one of them is its own operational uh, paradigm and even though they're put on a network with other APs, their configuration, their entire operational uh, intelligence lives, you know, in, within it versus, you know, a thin AP that needs the controller to do anything. And where it gets a little more nebulous is the, you know, the APs that are still get configured from the cloud, but once they're configured, if the cloud were to fall apart, they will still operate. You just can't make any changes to them. But like I say, so you got you got a safe answer, and then you got kind of a kind of a hybridy answer, if you will. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Olivier asks, uh, in reference to physical protection, what enclosure do you use for APs and basketball gyms? I think um, I, you know I see those. Uh, metal cages around those APs a lot. I always think, oh man, I wish they would just take that off. <laughs> but uh, yeah. anything stand out there, Lee? A lot of times the, um, you know, I, so on, on the topic of the metal cage, and I'll try to be really quick and get right back to the question. I do remember going back to my Air Force days and a lot of our test equipment and the electronic warfare career field, um, 
needed to be on and in a controlled environment. And it was always behind a chain link fence and we actually needed it to transmit. And it's like, why are we doing this behind a fence? And somebody sat down and explained to me on a napkin or a piece of paper, it's all in the spacing of those links. And this is why, you know, the aperture on that fence has no bearing on this particular frequency, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that's kind of thought provoking. I know that that kind of thought isn't going into those cheesy uh, wire, <laughs> wire cage things in gyms. Um, but the only reason I say that is, you know, just because it's metal in front of an AP uh, wire doesn't necessarily mean that it's absolutely killing the signal. It's certainly not helping it, but there's more to it than ah, thou shalt not. But so to get to the question, um, yeah, there's a whole range of them. We use um, enclosures uh, from Ventev, Tesco. Um, I don't mean to just... Um, pick favorites here, it's just my brain is only going so fast on the fly. Um, there's a lot of them uh, to be had and to be found, um, you know, plastic, fiberglass, uh, some of them are, you know, different NEMA ratings if you need that, whatever, but um, there's a lot of, thankfully there's a lot of options, but people do tend to go the homemade route too, and, you know, we'll have the machine shop whip something up out of the wire cagey stuff that you're talking about. I can't, tell you that I have any one that's like, um, you know, this is the one you should use because we, we, I, whatever, my, my team, we have a whole variety of them in play. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, maybe one last question here from Forrest. Uh, he wanted clarification on um, outdoor APs uh, shutting down because of heat is that because of a uh, hardware failure or the APs have actually like a thermal switch in them that'll shut them down? I don't know the answer to that. I do know that uh, the cable that's feeding an AP could start to, uh, um, you could disrupt the PoE signaling that goes into that if heat gets high enough. Um, Lee, anything to add there? Uh, I know that every um, network component has an operational value on the spec sheet. You know, it's good from, you know, negative whatever, neg 20 Fahrenheit to, you know, 125 Fahrenheit. And then I'm sure that for a lot of them, there's also a fudge factor. But um, there was a time where in one of our data centers, we were having massive temperature problems and things would shut down. Um, so, you know, an AP in the full sun, if the operating temperature is rated to be, you know, you can go up to 120 and you're in the Arizona desert and the sun is shining right on that thing and, you know, you can fry an egg on it. All I can say is don't be, su don't be surprised if it shuts down. Um, you know, there, there's a reason that vendors put out the spec, how it works, whether it's a, um, something senses the temperature and then shuts everything down to protect it. I'm really not sure of the operational theory and I'm guessing that it might uh, vary from uh, component to component, AP to AP, different vendors, whatever. Um, you know, like I say, the, the thermal shutdown, whatever the protection mechanism is, I can't tell you that I know, but I know that it's fairly easy to test. Heat one up, watch the temperature, it'll go to its rated plus 10 or 15 degrees, and then it's gonna shut itself down generally. 